Hello, Our Lady Perpetual Help. It's great to be with you again to talk to you now about the sixth book in the series, The Silver Chair. Uh, we're going to keep it simple this time around uh, just because of timing uh, and trying to catch up with everything else. Uh, but The Silver Chair is an interesting uh, book. It takes place uh, with Hustis uh, and... Jill are the two main characters uh, from our world that are in this school, uh, which C.S. Lewis has a, a lot of things to say in the negative. It was not, uh, he did not think much of that school, uh, and it seemed like it was not a good place for Jill and Hustis. Uh, so they are being pursued. Uh, Hustis encounters Jill while she's crying because she was being picked on. Uh, and then Hustis uh, shows her charity and kindness. Um, and then he starts to tell her how and why he's changed from what he was like last year because of his adventures in Narnia. Uh, and so they decide they're going to ask Aslan to come and to Narnia uh, because he said well maybe it's possible uh, and he recognized that doing things to make Aslan do something would not be received well but in asking uh, maybe Aslan would respond and he does uh, they are drawn into or able to go through a door uh, that leads them into As uh, to Narnia to Aslan's country and they actually start in Aslan's country in the place in which the Voyage of the Dawn Treader ended, or actually not where it ended, because they were still on the shore, the shore of Aslan's country, but then way up in the distance, uh, way in the air, they could see these great mountains uh, above them, which was Aslan's country. And so that's where they begin. And they actually start on the edge, uh, so close to the edge, in fact, that Hustis is afraid that Jill is going to fall over the edge and he tries to help her and Jill sort of being from this school uh, that is very abrasive and very harsh uh, responds in a negative way and acts in a way that causes Hustis to fall over the edge um, but again this is Aslan's country uh, Nat Narnia and so uh, Jill sees him fall and is obviously uh, terribly uh, sad and uh, just disturbed by it. Uh, but Aslan runs over and blows uh, Hustis uh, to safety. But uh, Jill doesn't realize this until a little bit later. Uh, but Jill sort of collapses uh, in her despair. And when she wakes up, she... Uh, tries to get some water because she's thirsty. Uh, it's just an interesting scene where Jill recognizes uh, that she's thirsty and there's this big lion and so there's a danger in uh, drinking water. And Aslan is there right by the stream and says, you know, if you're thirsty, drink. Uh, but she's afraid and says, you know, could you like go away? <laughs> and telling uh, Aslan to go away, she recounts is like telling a mountain to move uh, because of course Aslan is is God. Uh, and then she says, well, will you promise not to eat me? And he says, I don't promise anything. Um, and she says, well, do you eat little girls? And he says, I've, you know, ended, uh, you know, nations and whole countries uh, not in a way to be mean but just the reality uh, but finally she she drinks uh, and it's in drinking uh, that she is refreshed and has the ability to sort of see clearly and Aslan starts to interact with her uh, and he first calls her out uh, and says you know where's Eustace and she says he's fallen and why did he fall Aslan says because uh, I was showing off, right? So Jill admits it, and then Aslan is 
you know, continues to be able to communicate and be kind to her uh, by her admission. And so he says the difficulty of your quest is going to be more uh, difficult because of that choice that you made. And so the first thing Aslan does is he gives uh, Jill the four signs. That quest that she and Hustis are sent on uh, to be led forward. So the first sign uh, is that as soon as she encounters Hustis, uh, that she must tell him to uh, speak to someone that he knew from before, uh, which she's like, okay, that's not a big deal. He would probably do that anyway. The second sign uh, is you have to journey out of Narnia to the north until you come to the city of the ancient giants. And then the third sign is you shall find uh, writing on stone in that ruined city that you must do what the writing tells you. And then the fourth sign, you will know the lost prince if you find him by this, that he will be the first person you have met in your travels who will ask you to do something in my name, in the name of Asland. So these four signs are sort of their waypoint as they move forward. Uh, but just the way in which they're called to remember them, uh, or the, the way in which C.S. Lewis writes the book, he doesn't mention the signs again uh, until they're already on their journey because Jill doesn't really think about it. And Aslan even says the air is clear up here. Once you go down there, it's going to be much harder to remember. So the first thing you must do is remember, remember. And then he blows her uh, on her way as well. And she actually traverses over the islands that the Voyage of the Dawn Treader uh, voyaged through to reach Aslan's country or the edge of the world. And so uh, she's blown all the way into, As into Narnia uh, where she encounters Eustace. And she, tries, she does actually try and tell him right away uh, to say hi, but he doesn't really recognize what has happened. Uh, sort of because, you know, he's only been there once before. This is his second time. He doesn't realize that, I don't know, 40 years or 50 years has passed since the last time he was there, maybe longer. And so there's uh, some difficulty there. And then Hustis is obviously a little cross with Jill uh, for, you know, making him fall or, you know, causing him to fall. Um, so they don't really start off on a great, uh, great footing. But eventually they realize that the scene that they see is the king leaving on a ship. Unfortunately, it's after the ship's already been, uh, has taken off. Uh, but they meet Trumpkin and uh, an owl, uh, Glimfeather, uh, who becomes important as they set off on their journey. But they're brought before Trumpkin by Glimfeather and uh, they reveal the Glimfeather their quest, and Glimfeather says, don't tell Trumpkin, uh, and he explains that later. But Trumpkin gives them uh, beds and lets them wash up and dinner, uh, and right before they go to bed, uh, Glimfeather comes to Jill's window uh, as he already went to Hustis and brought him to this meeting of... Uh, the, the Parliament of Owls. Uh, and so once Jill and Hustis are together in this Parliament of Owls, uh, Hustis says, well, you know, I'm, a, I'm the king's man. I'm for uh, King uh, Caspian. So, you know, anything against him, we're not about. And they said, well, we meet at night and we don't know why the rest of the world meets during the day because they're owls and owls are nocturnal. Uh, so sort of that funny recognition that animals have different uh, sleep cycles than what we're used to. So anyway, they reveal uh, what has happened in the last uh, 20 years. That uh, the king had a child uh, and he uh, and his mother went out one night uh, and they were uh, the the mother was attacked by a great serpent and uh she eventually dies um and so the son 
is you know bent on trying to um, find Prince Rillian is trying to find the serpent uh, but one day after going out many times uh, his friend uh, sort of encounters him and asks him you know what you need to stop searching for vengeance especially for you know a dumb beast that you know caused the death of your mother and he says oh i'm not worried about that anymore uh but he goes and the his friend goes with him and says um let me see this great beauty that you've seen because he says i've seen a great beauty and sort of uh and so he goes with him <clears throat> and they meet this lady in green uh and are just prince really is enamored by this woman's beauty uh so his friend goes back and s says you know like he's, he's a little concerned and and said maybe i should tell somebody about it but he doesn't want to you know tell on the prince when you know he's brought him into this in confidence and so the son prince Rillian. Uh, next time he goes out, he doesn't come back, and so the friend reveals to Prince Ca or King Caspian uh, what has happened, uh, and King Caspian charges at him, uh, but then breaks down and cries, uh, and says, "I've lost my mother and my son, uh, or my wife and my son. Do I need to lose a friend as well?" And then they embrace. And they try and uh, find Prince Rillian. But many people try over the course of several years, and they're unable to find Prince Rillian to the point where they said, let's, let's not do this. Um, and so the reason why Glimfeather and the Parliament of Owls took them away to talk about this is because Trumpkin would have prevented them from going on this journey because he's following the king's rule even though that Aslan was the one that gave them the quest. So the Glimfeather uh, and the Owls are not super happy uh, when they find out they're going north uh, to the ancient city of giants. So they pass them off to a marsh wiggle, Puddleglum. Puddleglum is uh, a great character. He talks pretty much all in dour uh, down trodden ways, uh, but he is always working uh, to bring good. Uh, so he invites them in, and and they go to sleep almost immediately, because of course they stayed up all night um, instead of sleeping. <laughs> so they sleep until the evening, uh, where Puddleglum is there uh, cooking, fishing and cooking. Uh, and so they, they're given a great meal by Puddleglum, which he downplays, uh, and he reveals that he's going to go with them. Uh, and he's going because all the other uh, Marsh Wiggles have said he's way too happy and cheery. He needs to, to be, uh, <laughs> see the, the darker reality, I guess, which is funny because he's always uh, sort of dour. Uh, wet blanket is what Jill calls him. Um, but they go off uh, towards the City of Giants, and they see a woman in green with a black knight who has his face covered. Uh, and then they tell, the, the woman tells the two, or well, the three, uh, that there's the City of Giants, and they should go to the City of Giants, and that's where they're trying to go anyway, so, you know, they're like, oh yeah. Uh, but that there's, you know, warmth and group food and, you know, that she, she says to tell them, tell the giants that they send, they're sending them, the, the children and the marsh wiggle for the autumn feast. And so they're so caught up in the autumn feast, not so much Puddleglum, but, uh, Puddleglum's very, uh, stuck on the signs. Uh, that Aslan gave, which makes good sense because following Aslan uh, always leads to good things. Uh, but they get both Jill more than Hustis, but uh, both Jill and Hustis get caught up in all the good things they're going to experience once they get to this cave of giants. And they encounter uh, harsh weather as they're going up north. Uh, snow and everything else. 
And so they go up, uh, and they see some giants on their way as well, uh, but the giants thankfully don't see them. Uh, and they're just throwing stones, uh, not at the children or Puddleglum, but uh, trying to hit things that... Um, because that's what they do, I guess. <laughs> but they, uh, they, they're close to Harfang, is the name of the, the castle where the giants live. And so on their way to Harfang, they uh, fall in a hole. Uh, and because it's dark and cold, they don't really explore it. Uh, but then they go on to Harfang, they're invited in, uh, they're given food and warm beds and clothing. Uh, and, and Jill and Hustis and the Marsh Wiggle, uh, are, you know, glad to be there. And they're like, oh yeah, we'll stick around for the autumn feast. But then they recognize that maybe they shouldn't be there. Then they remember the signs as soon as they get there. Uh, and they feel like the giants are trying to keep them. Uh, and so Jill, uh, plays a part to, you know, seem so endearing to the giants so they'll trust the children uh, and the marsh wiggle so they can get out uh, but they're still being watched um, and so they're with the cook uh, and Jill happens to read a cookbook which is open to a page that talks of uh, talks of cooking humans in a marsh wiggle uh, for the autumn feast. So they now, even more than uh, before, recognize that they need to get out of there. Also, they see out the window a big sign in the ruins of the giants, where they're supposed to go, that says, under me. Uh, and so they recognize that was the second sign, or the third sign. Um, and so they recognize they need to go under uh, the ruins. And they recognize also before when they were traveling and they fell in that hole, they were actually in the E of the, the carving of under me. So they're like, oh man, we screwed up another sign. And so they just know that they need to go. Uh, and obviously now with the fear of being eaten by the giants, uh, they... Uh, sneak out uh, but the hunting party of giants that was going out before uh, comes around as they're leaving and so they have to rush and then they have to push so they find an entry's way to a, a cavern and then they push stones in the way so that the hounds can't find them and then they roll down these stones and enter into uh, the underland uh, and so as they're, they fall down this deep, long hole, maybe a mile deep, I think they said, uh, or C.S. Lewis writes, and they encounter the Earthmen. And the Earthmen take them captive and lead them further in. Uh, so they have to crawl through crawl spaces, and then they eventually enter a uh, underground river, and they get on a boat, and then uh, get taken to this city or castle underneath, uh, this city of Earthmen and castle uh, under in the Underland. Um, and so they're brought to this castle and they, they, they're waiting for their queen, uh, but this person comes out and speaks to them and they find out this person is the Dark Knight. Uh, that they met up above, and they recognize this is the same woman that told them to go up to, you know, tell them to be a gift for the autumn uh, feast, right? So more or less sending them to be eaten. So they recognize this woman, this queen, as they call her, isn't a good person. Um, <clears throat> and so they, this black knight speaks to them, brings them into his chamber, and tells them sort of about his situation and says that every night he uh, becomes a raving lunatic and starts saying things against uh, the, the queen and uh, that <clears throat> they uh, will need to be you know, led out of his chamber. And they convince him to 
uh, allow them to be there with him. Uh, so they hide, and so the Earthmen uh, allow, after putting him in this silver chair, uh, allow the, the children, the, the Black Knight says, uh, have left. And so once the Earthmen go out, uh, he starts to change. Uh, and so you find out uh, that the Black Knight is actually Prince Rillian, and he is being controlled by the Silver Chair. Uh, and so the he says, in the name of Aslan, free me, so the Force sign. Uh, and so they recognize that they have to free him, and so that's what they do. They free him, and the first thing he does is he destroys the chair. Um, and so they start to talk to him and tell him sort of what's happened, and he's distraught in how long he's sort of been a captive of this queen. Um, but the queen actually comes back when, uh, when you know, after they destroyed the chair, and she uh, puts something uh, nox noxious into... Uh, into the fire and starts to persuade them. Uh, but uh, thankfully they're able to overcome it. And uh, I think it's it's Puddleglum that uh, knocks or stamps out the fire uh, with his feet. Um, again, Puddleglum being sort of a great character, uh, not trusting anyone uh, or seeing the worst, I guess, possibility out of anything, recognizing sort of this woman uh, is trying to, to do evil things. Uh, and so the, the enchantment is broken and the witch starts to become a serpent again. Uh, the woman, the w queen and the serpent being the same person uh, and starts to attack Prince Rillian. Uh, and so... Rillian thankfully overcomes the serpent and finds, you know, is joyful that she he's finally able to avenge his mother, um, recognizing that this queen or queen is similar to the White Witch uh, of the past. Um, so they then uh, accomplishing their quest, saving Prince Rillian. Uh, need to get out. And so the Earthmen are freed uh, from the Queen's control. And they don't know this at first. They think the Earthmen are against them. So they're trying to leave the city quietly. But everything starts breaking down uh, as the city was being held together uh, by the Serpent's uh, magic. And so uh, they encounter some Earth people and they finally realize that Earth people were under her control and they, you know, like make friends actually uh, with the Earth people. And the Earth people are like, we need to go uh, d deeper. The Queen has had us dig uh, to try and attack uh, Narnia to take over. Uh, and we, you know, it's so horrible that we're so close to the surface. And so all the Earthmen uh, go deeper uh, as that way gets closed up. And then Prince. Rillian, uh, Puddleglum, Jill, and Hustis all travel back. So the, the tunnels they've been digging uh, were their way back, thankfully, to Narnia. Um, and so they follow it all the way back, and they eventually uh, find the surface through uh, some toils. Uh, but, and then um, Prince Rillian and Jill and Hustis uh, are all taken to the king where Puddleglum is taken care of because of his burnt feet uh, from stepping on the fire. Um, and <laughs> it's just a, some funny scenes. Uh, but they're brought to uh, back to the city where they started and the ship with Prince K or King Caspian is just porting. Uh, but they find out that he's actually dying uh, as he was in poor health when he started. But Na Aslan sent him back uh, to, to meet his son. So they meet uh, one last time and then Aslan appears and licks uh, Jill and Hustis and they're brought uh, back into Aslan's country. Um, Aslan then asks 
them to put a large thorn in Aslan's paw, uh, and then he, the blood that comes from it drops in a pool, and King Caspian uh, is brought into Aslan's country. Uh, so he dies and is brought into Aslan's country uh, through this, you know, blood of Aslan, right? The blood of Christ. Uh, um, and so uh, they have this, this moment of uh, reunion with Caspian, uh, as Hustis was good friends with him back in the day. Uh, and then it's time for them to go home. And what they do is they, um, or what Aslan sets up is allows King Caspian to come out with uh, Hustis and Jill to sort of fight off the bullies of uh, the school before uh, going back, King Caspian going back to Aslan's country, uh, which is a funny scene. And it's, it's especially funny, sort of the wrapping up of the school, the principal, the head, as they call it, uh, is called, you know, gets in trouble for the way in which she was running the school. And then she becomes a politician and does very well. So <laughs> little critique. Um, but this this story uh, is is interesting in the sense that it is the fourth book that C.S. Lewis wrote, and he mentions uh, the horse and his boy in this. Uh, and so, like, different aspects of this story is sort of, like, enlivens and enriches the world to allow him uh, to go back and write The Horse and His Boy and rethink uh, sort of the, the groundworks of this great series. And then, of course, the final book that he writes is what we'll be write, reading uh, in, or going over in two weeks, uh, the last battle, which is you know glorious ending uh, to the series, uh, which I look forward to. I think you know, I'm really looking forward to to talking about the last battle because there's so much imagery and so much uh, obvious Christianity uh, built into all these books, but especially in the last battle. Uh, so God bless you, and I look forward to speaking to you uh, about the silver chair in a couple days. <laughs>